Thank you for joining us again tonight and today, no matter, it depends on where you are in the world, but uh, thank you for listening and studying with Lesson 8, and tonight we're talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I think this is one of the, the most important teachings we will do, and you know, I said that about last week's teaching, and uh, we did have a great time last week. The Lord gave us great revelation on the Holy Spirit in the daily life of the believer. And tonight, we want to share with you about three events that have radically changed the world. And they may not be what you're thinking, but of course, the first one is the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then the third one is the day of Pentecost, and that brought to the earth and to the body of Christ and to the church the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, the results of these three events have produced at least three billion followers in the earth. Now, they say there's seven billion people on planet earth. Some say two billion are believers. Some say three. But anyway, the results of the day of Pentecost and the results of the baptism in, with, and by the Holy Spirit are incalculable. Uh, there's no way of telling around the earth and the world what has happened. In 1900s, there was a movement called the Azusa Street Revival, and that is still going today all around the world. And so the work of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, is so vital for the body of Christ. Now, this lesson is uh, going to take us through the Scripture, the biblical basis for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and uh, how to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and then hindrances as to why people do not receive the infilling and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And we'll work through those in the next hour or so. But um, my life-changing encounters, of course, have been the night I was born again 48 years ago in the Creasy Lane Baptist Church, and the Holy Spirit just dropped from heaven and dropped on me and convicted me of my lostness and of eternity and that I needed Jesus. And that power of conviction drew me to Him that night. And then it was uh, about three months later as a young evangelist. In fact, it was my first revival meeting. I was preaching in Corbin, Kentucky in a coal mining town. And uh, I preached the message and when I finished... At that time, I was, uh, I was a loud, screaming preacher. And uh, uh, when I finished the message to give the invitation, they kind of looked at me like I was some crazy man, and probably I was. But anyway, I invited them to come to the altar with their teenagers, and they just sat there. Nobody moved. And uh, after the service, I took the teenagers into a back room, and in that back room, we begin to pray, and these teenagers begin to confess. They begin to weep. And the pastor, uh, to my right, we were on our knees, and he was just out of seminary, and he had his glasses off, and he was crying, and I was thinking, what is this? I had no idea what was going on. Well, God was bringing a revival. A little teenage girl sat on one of the tables in that room, and she reached up into heaven, and it's like she brought Jesus down into that room. And the presence of God was so incredible. And like a 747, the Holy Spirit came into that room and landed in my heart. And uh, before I knew it, I was drunk in the Spirit. I've been drunk many other times, but this was uh, a work of the Holy Spirit. And I was drunk in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and an event that would change my life forever. Then it wasn't too long later when I was in seminary, and uh, about 4 o'clock in the morning, a young friend of mine was ministering to me again in regards to the baptism and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And as he ministered to me, there came out of me rivers of living water and a new language that I'd never heard, that I'd never spoken before, and of course, it was the biblical gift of tongues or speaking in tongues or my spiritual language. 
and a way to praise God and to love Him and to move in the powerful things of God. And those two events changed my life forever and dramatically put me on a course that would lead me into the person, work, and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we've been teaching and sharing with you over these weeks. Now, with these experiences, I will say that it's very important. In fact, it's necessary that every believer be baptized in the Holy Spirit, that they be filled with the Holy Spirit, that they have a genuine, distinct experience with the Holy Spirit beyond the point of salvation that empowers them to do the works of God. And uh, that's necessary in order to live the victorious life, in order to be an overcomer. It takes that power of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. Now, Joel called it the outpoured spirit. Joel 2, 28 to 32, that we'll look at later. John the Baptist called it the baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus commands the disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they be endued or clothed with power from on high or mantled. Just like Elisha received the mantle of Elijah, his cloak, it was his clothing from that point on. So on the day of Pentecost, the believers were mantled, they were clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And it fit them well as they tumbled out of the upper room into the streets to change every street in the no world with the life-altering message of Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. And so Peter explained it after the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit had fallen, and these 120 were filled with the Spirit. They were coming out into the streets they were all speaking in a foreign language that matched the language in the heart of those nations who were there in the book of Acts in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And some thought they were drunk. Some thought they were a lot of things. But Peter said, this is that which the Joel, the prophet, had prophesied. And each of us, get to live in that mighty work of the Holy Spirit here now, 2,000 years later, uh, that God instituted on the day of Pentecost. And it's a marvelous, wonderful thing. Now, I have studied what many leaders, Christian leaders, and these are Christian leaders in all denominations. And uh, as I studied them, they all profoundly agree that the baptism of the Holy Spirit brings spiritual power. And across the board, any denomination you can think of, great leaders around the world, the great men that have shook the world, the great men that have uh, taken nations in their hands and heart and brought to them the good news, that have turned the world upside down, they all agree in a baptism in the Holy Spirit that it has great power. Now, while we all may not agree when this happens or how it happens or what takes place when it happens, but all of us honor the third person of the Godhead or the Trinity who is the Holy Spirit. We honor Him as we honor Jesus as we honor the Father, so we honor the Holy Spirit in our lives because on the day of Pentecost, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit began in a new and a greater way for all of the known world. Now, the Holy Spirit is the power that is necessary to do the supernatural works and ministry of the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings us into great intimacy with the Father and Jesus, His Son. And so in Acts 2, the baptism 
in the Holy Spirit took place on the day of Pentecost. Now, there was only one day of Pentecost, and that was reserved for the birthing of the gospel to all nations and the birthing of the New Testament church. But since then, there have been many outpourings all around the world, and they continue today in your nations, in your churches, all around the world, we see the floodgates of the Holy Spirit open and people receiving this marvelous work of God, this promise of God into their life. And it's an experience to be lived in daily as we shared in the last lesson. Now, there is one baptism in the Holy Spirit, but there are many fillings beyond salvation. That is excluding water baptism or the baptism in suffering or in fire. There's one baptism in the Holy Spirit and that's enough to take you until Jesus comes. That's enough to lead you until finally you breathe your last breath or Jesus comes to take you home. But we are continually being filled all of the time. Thus, we need to be filled every day. And it's important that when we wake up every day, we ask the Holy Spirit, fill me today fresh and new with your spirit and with your power and with everything that you have. Fill my life, consume me today so that I can do what I am supposed to do in the earth. And then you pray that prayer and guess what happens? He does it, and it's a beautiful work to live with every day because He brings all that Jesus has to us. He brings all that the Father has to us. In John 14 to 16, we see these tremendous truths of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. So first, as with me 48 years ago, uh, the Holy Spirit convicts a person and then uh, draws them to Jesus so that they can be forgiven of their sins and their lostness. The greatest sin is rejecting Jesus Christ. It's not a lot of other sins that probably I could name right now, but when a person receives Jesus Christ and comes into their life, then He gives them the ability to overcome the other sins that may be in their life. Now, that doesn't mean we don't repent of sin, because the second thing he does, once he convicts us, he draws us to Jesus through repentance and through faith, and we're born again by the Word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit that takes us out of the kingdom of darkness and puts us into the kingdom of light. And so... Then, once you're born again, the Holy Spirit enters your life and seals you until the day of the redemption of your physical body. And so, the Holy Spirit seals us unto eternity, and that's a beautiful work of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you're born again, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and lives within you. And it is at this time that you are baptized into the body of Christ. Paul says that we've all been made to drink into one spirit, baptized into the body of Christ. Now, through the promise of the Father, after you've been born again, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father to Jesus and to all of us was for the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So after you're born again, then we, we, we hunger and we thirst after all that God has, and particularly the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit as we're thirsty and seeking and believing on Him and in Him. And then that Holy Spirit river becomes rivers and it flows out of us to a world who needs the love of Jesus and the truth of the gospel. So we're, 
we're born again of the Holy Spirit for salvation. That time we're baptized into the Holy Spirit and sealed. Then we're baptized into the Holy Spirit with power for service. And this is after the time of salvation. Or there are some instances where it happens at salvation. I've known many people who, as they were born again, coming up out of the baptismal waters, the Holy Spirit fills them, and it's almost a concurrent event with them. And so the important thing is is not to argue over how and when and why, but it's just to receive. The Holy Spirit is so eager. He so wants you to receive His fullness and all that He has that He'll choose at different times to do things different ways that may change our theology and may make us think a little bit differently because it doesn't happen the same to all of us but the baptism and the goodness and the results of it come from the hand of a gracious God and so church leaders and I'm talking to many church leaders you must yourself be filled with the Spirit be baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and receive the beautiful gift of tongues, your prayer language, which we're going to talk about at another time, and then open your heart to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Leaders must model the work of the Holy Spirit. Many places around the world where I go, leaders themselves do not live in the realm of the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and therefore they, they, they do not teach their congregations. Here in America, it's the same way. There's an ignorance of the Holy Spirit in the American church because of the lack of teaching and modeling and training people in the person, work, and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so we as leaders must do that. We must produce Spirit-filled and Spirit-led empowered churches and we have to lead the way and uh, and it must not only be taught but it must be exampled you must example in your church the workings of the Holy Spirit the giftings of the Holy Spirit you must give way to the expression of the Holy Spirit in your church and we as believers every believer every leader is accountable to God and the Father and Jesus as to what we have done with the person of the Holy Spirit. Now that's a sobering fact. It's a sobering truth. We're accountable for everything, but we're really accountable for what we do with the person of the Holy Spirit. And um, I believe that. Jesus thought it was so important for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on the day of Pentecost with the gift of tongues and with fire that he said, I have to leave you now. And if I don't leave you, I cannot send him. And it's more profitable. It's better for me to go so I can send him the Holy Spirit the comforter, the teacher, uh, the one who will help you do all things. If I go, I can send him. And so Jesus thought it was so important that he went to the Father to send the Holy Spirit to do what it needed to do. And so Jesus leaves them to another spiritual dimension that would rock their world and transform their lives to redeem the world with the life-altering message of Jesus Christ and His witness about Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. That is what was preached and taught and it was that power that brought all of humanity in the known world, after Jesus ascended to heaven, it was that truth 
that delivered the whole world into the kingdom of God. Then the Holy Spirit thought it was so important that He released the gifts of the Spirit to the new church. And as leaders, we are accountable to steward the gift of the Holy Spirit that has come to us. Now, seven times, there are seven verses in the New Testament that specifically mention the baptism in the Holy Spirit. There's five in the Gospels, and then there's two in the book of Acts. And so, when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, that experience I had in that coal mining Kentucky town in that back room when the Holy Spirit came and landed with the gift of love and evangelism and understanding, and then in that seminary apartment when the Holy Spirit filled me fresh again and released my gift in tongues, those two experiences set me on a course to find out what had happened in my life. Now, I had nobody to teach me. I was going to a, uh, a biblical institution where they didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they said all kinds of things about Him. But, but I had just received those experiences in a prior matter of months, and I knew it was real. And then I was pastoring a church that um, was not in the persuasion of the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. But, but I knew in my heart what had happened. You see, uh, the, person, uh, the person who has the argument always has to sit at the feet of the person who has the experience. And I had the experience, and I knew it was biblical, but I didn't know much about it. So I spent the next year studying, reading, praying, and developing from the Scriptures what I saw to be the basis for what had happened to me on those nights and in succeeding days. And uh, so it began to develop in the biblical basis for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, the prophet Joel talks about it in Joel 2, 28-32, and we've read that several times with you already. But uh, this is the great prophecy of Joel, the great prophet who prophesied the day of Pentecost. And uh, it was 700 years before the day of Pentecost took place that Joel prophesied this. Now, you know, uh, Joel probably had no understanding of what he was saying. Many times when a prophetic word comes, we don't. And... The Spirit of God uh, entered His being in such a way that He prophesied this that was going to happen 700 years later. I don't understand it, but that's the genius of the Holy Spirit. That's the genius of the Scriptures. That's the genius of our God. Uh, he is unlimited, and He can do anything. And He's beyond reason so many times and intellectual thought. He, he's beyond uh, uh, ourselves, our finite beings. And because of that, that's why he's God. And so Joel prophesies this. And uh, there's over 350 prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus that came true with Jesus' life and with the resurrection. And here's this one prophecy. And there's two or three other indications through Isaiah and Ezekiel about this day that would take place. But Joel brings this concrete, sure fast prophecy. And it's one of the most important prophecies that we see in the Old Testament. And so we have the prophet Joel, where he says, Afterward it will come to pass that uh, God would pour out His Spirit upon all humanity, upon all flesh. And, and uh, we've seen that in and uh, young men would dream dreams, and old men would have visions, and maids and servants would prophesy, and, and uh, uh, it talks about the, the, the moon and blood and all of that. And in, in the final day, it says, from Mount Zion, 
Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the prophecy was not only just for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for the earth, but also it was for the message of salvation to the Jews in Israel from Mount Zion and to all of humanity. So it's a, it's a twin prophecy that Joel prophesies that literally today is impacting and affecting all of humanity and the whole world. Everywhere we go, the, the greatest works we see being done on the foreign field and overseas and in the nations are through people who've been filled with the Spirit and are operating in the power of the Spirit. That doesn't mean the works that others are doing are not good and not right. I'm not saying that. Uh, everybody is doing their part and their place. But the masses that are coming to Christ are through the Pentecostal empowered people of God to win the millions. So Joel's prophecy. Then number two is the prophet John. So as I begin to study these scriptures and I begin to pile up page after page after page of information and writing and, and add a stack about like that of material that I'd written and studied, then I came to the Gospels and I found out John the Baptist and there's John the Baptist who was the end of the law, who was ushering in Jesus, the age of grace, and there's John and uh, he's uh, baptizing people and... Um, he said, uh, there comes someone mightier than I. I'm not worthy to untie or unlatch his sandal strap. I baptize you with water under repentance, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And uh, as I begin to read this, of course, John is talking about the day of Pentecost. And not only does he say it in Matthew, but in Mark, in Luke, in John, in all of the four Gospels, the Holy Spirit saw that it was so important for this to be in the canon or in the scriptures or in the determined books of the Bible, the Holy Spirit who wrote the Bible and breathed on men to write down what he said made sure that John the Baptist would say this not once, but four times, and it was recorded four times. And uh, so when I begin to see this, I begin to think, you know, that, that uh, what I've received is so powerful, and it's so awesome, and it's right here in Scripture. And uh, for me, this began to cement or... Uh, in my heart begin to settle in in a hard and a fast way as I begin to put biblical scripture to the experience that I'd had. Then number four, we see the Pentecost fulfillment, and that's Acts chapter 2. And uh, we've read that several times now, and it's in your notes, it's in your book, but this was the fulfillment. And suddenly there came a rushing sound from heaven, a mighty sound, a wind came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting. It was like the volcanic hurricane. It was a deafening roar and to such that it brought all the people in Jerusalem to this location. And, and, and then, it, 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 then it was a, there was a, a ball of fire and it separated cloven tongues of fire on each of the 120 heads of those that were there in the room. And this is the fire John was talking about. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then in Acts chapter 2, that, that day of Pentecost came and, and, and what a deal it was. But before the day of Pentecost, I, I missed one. We talked about Joel, and we talked about the prophet John, and how could I leave out the prophet Jesus? Well, with this iPad, I just moved my finger too fast, and I missed the most important man. He's our man, Jesus. And so uh, Jesus, in Luke 24, 49, told the disciples before he slipped into heaven, he said, go and tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued or clothed with power from on high. And then 
Uh, of course, th that was in prediction to the day of Pentecost. And then in John chapter 7, 37 to 39, it was at the day of the feast when Jesus stood up and he cried out. He, he literally screamed it out. If any of you are thirsty, come and drink of me. Don't drink of this water that's just been poured out, but come and drink of me. And out of your innermost being, out of your spiritual womb, out of your, uh, uh, your heart will flow rivers of living water. And the scripture says that Jesus was talking about something that would take, play, take place after he was glorified because the day of Pentecost, it doesn't say the day of Pentecost, but it's referring to Pentecost and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's what he's referring to. And so then Jesus in Acts uh, uh, 1, 4, 5, and 8, he says, after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, uh, you'll receive power and you'll be witnesses unto me. And so there's the Spirit flow again and there's the power to be witnesses. On the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Spirit and they receive Acts 1, 8 power to be help them be a witness to all the nations and to all peoples. And so Pentecost is, is just not, it's the filling of the Spirit and it's the releasing of all the things that are in the Holy Spirit and the things of the Spirit, but the, the twin side of the coin is, and, and after the power comes upon you, you should be witnesses unto me in Judea, Samaria, and uh, the uttermost parts of the nations after you finish in Jerusalem. And so Jesus gives this tremendous uh, word about the day of Pentecost. So as I begin to read these scriptures, I begin to think what people are telling me is not true. What others have said is not true. What I've read in many commentaries is not true. What I've read here about this, this time past is not true. This is a beautiful, marvelous, wonderful experience. And for it to be untrue, you've got to go back through 2,000 years of history and you've got to deal with millions and millions and probably a billion or so of people who've received this power, who've operated in this power, who have done the works of God, who are changing the face of the earth because they were filled with the power of God and the baptism in and with and by the Holy Spirit. Now you can't do that. I can't do that. I don't know of anybody on the face of the earth that can. An intellectual can't do it. A theologian can't do it. A denominational expert cannot do it. Nobody can do what God, nobody can undo what God has done is the, the simple truth. Now, you can bring all kinds of arguments, but nobody can undo what God has done and what He's leashed upon the earth and what He's put inside of you and put inside of me. Now, so we came to Acts chapter 2, Acts, Acts chapter two and we see the Pentecost fulfillment. And then uh, uh, we come to the prophet Peter. Peter talked about this is that which Joel had prophesied. And um, you know, the beautiful thing about this is, is that the day of Pentecost didn't take the apostles, the 120, by surprise. Now, Jesus taught them for 40 days through the Holy Spirit before they went into the upper room for 10 days. Now, he wasn't twiddling his thumbs and he wasn't just looking around in the blue sky, and, but he was teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And one of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God is the baptism in the Holy Spirit because uh, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is the working of the Holy Spirit. And so maybe they didn't know exactly how it was going to happen, when it was going to happen, 
But Jesus had taught them and brought them into the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he had uh, taught them before in John 14 to 16 all about the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to leave you now and he's going to come. And he began to tell them all of that rich, beautiful truth that we see in John 14 to 16. And so I began to look at this biblical basis on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then I began to read in the book of Acts and, and I found out that, uh, that uh, over and over again in the New Testament church, we read about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and what happened in all of those encounters. And so in the life of the New Testament church, we see that work of the Holy Spirit. Then I came across the scripture uh, of the Apostle Paul, and these are listed in your notes. Ephesians 5.18, Paul said, be filled with the Spirit. Now, in the language, that's a command. Uh, and so Paul commanded them to be filled with the Spirit. Now, he wasn't talking to unbelievers. He wasn't talking to Christian believers. Paul was talking to mature believers. He had spent almost three years in Ephesus. He raised up one of his greatest churches. There were 50-some thousand members in the Ephesian church all scattered throughout the city. And Paul told them, commanded them to be filled with the Spirit. Now that word is to be controlled by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit to control everything they do. The, the, the Holy Spirit is to control our lives. And the tense there in the verb is, it's an ongoing feeling to continuously be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And so it's not a one-time event. Uh, I heard someone say one time, Pastor, I was filled with the Holy Spirit 20-some uh, years ago, and, uh, uh, but I haven't felt Him since then. Well, somebody's not been taught <laughs> what the Word of God says, and, and this is a continuous, ongoing feeling. And so these are... Some of the scriptures, the, the biblical uh, basis for the uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, let's talk about the blessings and the benefits of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, whether you call it the baptism in the Holy Spirit or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit or the filling of the Holy Spirit or the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't matter what terminology that you've learned or uh, is that, that is out there about the Holy Spirit. The important thing is experience this work of the Holy Spirit. Experience Him. Now, it is a distinct work of the Holy Spirit at and after salvation it is a definite experience. Now let me explain that. There are those who when they are born again, that at that time the Holy Spirit baptizes them into the body of Christ. And along with that at the same time, they're filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, I've seen it happen. Does it happen with everybody? No. But can it happen with somebody? Sure. The Holy Spirit has the ability to do that. He, he chooses how to severally divide what He wants to do. The, the Holy Spirit knows our personalities. He knows what we may be facing. He knows what we've been through. And He knows what is taking place as the beautiful work of salvation is taking place within us. And the Holy Spirit has reasons for doing things that He does. And you know, it's probably best not to second guess him. And praise God, if he's doing a work in somebody and it's a genuine work of the Holy Spirit and it fits biblical truth, then allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do and, 
and don't make him do for somebody like he did it for you. Uh, the Holy Spirit has enough things to do without us telling him or second guessing as to what he wants to do. So it is different from the point of salvation. And as I said, it can happen at that time, but it is a different experience. Usually it comes after salvation and God does it to bring power to a life and to bring all of the works of the Spirit into the life of a believer so he can enjoy the things of the Spirit and so he can enjoy Jesus because it's the Holy Spirit that brags on Jesus and tells us all about Jesus and reveals Jesus to us. And so it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And so the blessings are incredible. Now, Joel said it's the pouring out of the Spirit. Secondly, it's the promise of the Father. God, back before the earth was created, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit all met together in a, in a council. They all met together to discuss about how everything would happen, take shape, develop here on the earth. And this was discussed. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit determined so many things that would take place on the earth. And uh, it was the promise of the Father. And I don't know how he made it, but to Jesus, you know, I'm going to have to pour out my Spirit upon the earth because they're going to have to have the Spirit resident within them. And, and the Holy Spirit, you know, was just excited about it. He was going to get to be the one. Well, how it all took place, we really don't know. But it's the promise of the Father. And God knew and Jesus knew, and the Holy Spirit knew that after salvation, we would need His work inside of us and in us. So it's, it's the poured out Spirit, it's the promise of the Spirit, and it's the power of God. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is mentioned over 300 times, and in almost all of the direct references, it's a reference to power. And so the Holy Spirit is a, he's a divine energy. He's a, something greater than ourselves. Uh, I don't know about you, but in and of myself, I find myself helpless and hopeless. And, uh, you know, I need help. And... Uh, I need help with the Holy Spirit to, to teach you and to share these truths. But um, uh, we face things and, and, and we need His energy and He's a creating energy and He accomplishes things with, with supernatural strength. And it's that kind of spiritual power that every one of us need every single day to, to live in this world and to minister in this world. And to do the things of God, we need that power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we notice Acts 1.8 says, After the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall receive power to be witnesses unto me. Now, it's an amazing thing. To be a witness unto Jesus is to tell others about Jesus, is to give them an invitation to be born again, and for Christ to come into their life. And, you know, that just doesn't happen naturally. I, I read a statement in a book uh, a couple of weeks ago where the writer said that anybody can win anybody to Jesus. It really doesn't take any, any power, any, anything to do that. And, and I got thinking, wait a minute, my friend. It, it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to witness to somebody who's lost and is on their way to hell and they're, they're without God, it takes the power of the Spirit to be able to share with them Jesus and for Jesus to convict their heart by the Holy Spirit and for them to give their lives to Jesus. That's an incredible thing. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. Yeah, anybody can tell somebody about Jesus and anybody can go through a, a, a formula or whatever but if the power of the Holy Spirit is not there drawing and convicting, 
then nothing will be done, and you'll have a convert, but God won't have a convert. And I'm afraid too many times we all have too many converts that are ours and not the Holy Spirit's. It takes the power to overcome uh, the, the, the fears and limitations that we have to talk to somebody about Christ and for them to be born again. And Jesus said that whosoever should call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we must remember this, that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit the day of Pentecost, that they not only were filled with the Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, they were not only baptized with fire, but all of that, inherently within all of that, is to bring people to Christ, because after they were filled with the Spirit, and the tongues of fire, power, and purity were upon them, gave them the impetus then to, to preach in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. The two go together. Many times we see just one emphasis, but the two are together. And they work together in tandem. And so uh, we see the blessing is that we'll have the power to bring people to Jesus. What greater blessing than that? Uh, than to introduce somebody to Christ and see them born again into the kingdom of God and then them be filled with the Spirit and they go and do the same thing. I mean, what, that, that's one of the great blessings I think that we overlook so many times. Then another blessing with the baptism in the Holy Spirit, it is for purity and cleansing. Now, John said that you will be baptized and with fire. And the fire is the purging, purifying work of the Holy Spirit in this process we call sanctification. That's where we're continually separated unto God more and more and more. That every area of our life comes under the, the baptizing power of the fire of the Holy Spirit to where he, he cuts away things that shouldn't be in our life, habits or sins or attitudes or whatever, and, and cuts them away and, and separates us to the Father. It's the Holy Spirit. So when John said, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in fire, the next two verses that are there show that the winnowing fan was in the harvester's hand, and it's the idea of the wheat they're throwing the wheat in the air in the chaff. The useless part is, is blown away. In other words, they're sweeping clean the floor so that the, the good of the fruit of the harvest, the wheat can fall and it be there. And it's the idea of, of purifying us and cleansing us. Now, years ago in 1665 in London, there was the London Plague. And the plague filled the whole city and, and thousands and thousands and thousands were died. Uh, they could not find the reason. They could not find what was causing the plague. And, and uh, uh, they were at a standstill about how to deal with it. And, and, and everybody uh, was dying. And so then in 1666, I believe it is, there was a fire in London. And the fire burned all through the city and different parts of the city. And after the fire was over, and they began to sift through the rubble, and they began to look around, they noticed the, the rats had been burned, and on the rats were fleas. And it was the fleas that were on the rats that were causing the plague. And how they detected that, uh, but they detected that it was, it was the fleas, and they were the cause of, of uh, the death and the scourge that was, that was in the land of London. And it's an illustration of how the Holy Spirit burns deep within us, and He can burn out the bad, and He can burn in the good. And, and so I think we need to pray, baptize our hearts with fire. Lord, let that fire fall that, that burns out all of the stuff that is not good. 
a habit or a sin or an attitude or whatever, for the Holy Spirit to burn it out and to sanctify us and to cleanse us and to purify us so that we are, we are uh, moving in that process of being separated totally, totally to the Lord and for His kingdom work. And um, so it's that idea. So we love the Holy Spirit that fills us and we love speaking in our tongues and we love being blessed with all the blessings and gifts of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes we forget this part. And it's, it's the flame of God's righteousness that purges, and not to punish, but it purges us. It's the flame of God's righteousness to redeem and not to retaliate against us. And fire has the power to set something else on fire. And... Um, Fire never stays the same for more than two or three seconds. And it's that fire inside of us that will set the hearts of other lives that are afire. But it's that power of the Holy Spirit that brings that fire into our life and into our hearts and, and uh, uh, to, to allow us to set others on fire. They're, they're settled on them in the day of Pentecost, cloven tongues of fire. And the Holy Spirit becomes visible in human form. It was, they heard Him in the wind. And then they saw Him in the, the fire. They, they visibly saw that. And it was the, 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 the Spirit, fire, and fuel to proclaim the gospel to the nations and to all of the earth at that time. Now, it's the Holy Spirit fire that warms the coldest heart. Only the Holy Spirit can warm the heart that is cold and hardened and pulled away from God. I have seen it, you have seen it. And in these days and ages, we're seeing so many more people that people have prayed for through the years and they've continued to pray and all of a sudden their hearts are being warmed by the Holy Spirit and they're coming into the kingdom of God. And so the Holy Spirit has that ability to touch the hearts and invade the, the, the depths of our, of, our, of our soul and our mind and, and our being to where we sense the presence of God. The two disciples on the Emmaus Road after Jesus had risen from the dead and he began to talk to them. And, and uh, after he left them and it was revealed who he was, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? And it was that Holy Spirit fire. It was that word, that word that is ignited by the Spirit of God uh, the word that's the sword of the Spirit. That word was cutting and burning inside of their heart. The sword of the Spirit had gone into them. And it was that which began to burn inside them. And that's the fire that we need to cry out for and ask to be in our life all the time to separate us unto them. And so that's one of the blessings is is that fire. Now, we may not like it. We may not like the purging. We may not like the cleansing. We may not like that convicting and that sanctifying grace of God in our life, but it is so necessary. And, you know, uh, the other day, I, I think I had kind of a revelation, and you may know about this already, but I begin to think as, as you watch the lives of the apostles and the disciples after Pentecost, as you watch them through the New Testament, the Apostle Paul and all of those that he trained and the believers and all of that, there's not one record anywhere of any one of them being immoral, embezzling, uh, cheating, lying. There's not one example of them living a life ethically or morally wrong. Now, they were human 
and they missed it, but there's not one record in the Old Testament is full of them. And I wondered, how come not in the New Testament? And I think it's because that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and baptized with those fires and those cloven tongues of fire, I think that fire did a work in them that was so incredible, that was so beyond anything they ever experienced that it carried them all the way to the grave. And I say, may that fire purge us and redeem us and carry us to the grave to where we're morally right and ethically right and we're right in every way that we need to be to represent Him who is coming for us. And uh, uh, I think that's one of the blessings. Then another blessing of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is is the preparation for the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit in our life. Now, when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit both times, then the second time with the evidence of tongues, when I received that, from that moment forward, all of the gifts of the Spirit begin to operate in my life over a period of of six to eight months as the Holy Spirit taught me about each of those gifts. I would mentioned earlier, I didn't have anyone to teach me. And the Holy Spirit said, I'll be your teacher. And the Holy Spirit is the greater teacher. But when I'd been filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit, it was like it opened a floodgate to spiritual realities beyond just the reality of salvation. And as great, as wonderful, and good as that is, There is so much more. There's so much more in the realm of the Spirit. I got saved on a Sunday night. The next Sunday I was teaching a Sunday school class in my church. Here I am standing before middle school, junior high kids, and I'm teaching them. I've only been saved a week. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking, what am I doing? And, uh, and, and uh, so as I'm teaching them the lesson that had been given to me to teach, of course, the Holy Spirit said, there's more. There's more. The next week, after I was called to preach that week, I preached in a jail, my first sermon I preached. And as I'm preaching, I hear this again. There's more. There's more. When I left the jail that day, I was, I was living in this thing that there's more, and I didn't know what it was. And then I found out what it was when I was in that coal mining town and the Holy Spirit filled me with that great work and been in that seminary apartment. But over the years, after uh, the gifts began to open up to me, the Sunday, uh, the, the Sunday morning after I received on a Friday night, we were uh, in the country. We pastored a country church. That Sunday morning, I had a vision of a, of a young man, blonde hair, uh, uh, blue shirt, khaki pants. Clear vision. And I saw it. And, and so we, were, we left our parsonage and we walked up the hill to our little country church. And uh, so that Sunday morning, we, we uh, uh, began our service and conducted the service. And after the service, I gave the invitation and Walking down the aisle was a young man with blonde hair, blue shirt, khaki pants. And uh, he was a fine young man known all over the county and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And, and, and that was a vision. And then from that point on, the, the, all of the gifts begin to come here and there. And as I begin to study and I begin to learn. And when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's, it kind of opens the door for, for the everything else of God, the more of God. Then when I leave here tonight, I know there's more. When I leave here tonight, I know that I got to do again and do it again and again. And you see, there's never an end to the more of the Spirit. There's never an end to the the giftings and the the fruit of the Spirit that God wants to grow in your life. There's never an end to that. There's always more and more and more. And I want to encourage you tonight. You may think, well, I don't have what I need, and that's good. 
It's good to know that you don't have what you need or all you need because there's more for you. Pastor, there's more. Leader, there's more. Church member, there's more. Whoever's listening to this, it doesn't matter. There is more for you in the Spirit. And the Spirit will continually give you more and more and more. And you go stronger and stronger and stronger in the things of God. Just like Jesus, He grew strong in the Spirit. John the Baptist grew strong in the Spirit. And God wants to grow us strong in the Spirit and the things of the Spirit. And one of the blessings of the baptism is, is the gifts of the Spirit. And we see them in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4. And, and uh, 1 Peter 4 tells us how to operate. And so it opens the floodgates to all the things that are to come. Now, um, the Spirit is so eager to do what He wants to do in people. He's so desirous. He's so jealous. God is jealous of us. The Spirit is jealous over us. and He wants to do everything and do all that He can. And uh, it's, it's the blessing. Then there's the power for witnessing that we've already mentioned. One of the blessings is that power. And uh, it's a controlling experience. A lot of people are afraid of the work of the Holy Spirit because they believe it will cause them to do something stupid, something that's crazy, something they'll be chastised for. But the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Now, He's powerful and forceful when He wants to be, but He's a gentleman, and He understands, and you will be able to control. You will not be out of control because the Holy Spirit will guide you in, in your experience in Him. And uh, that's one of the blessings to know that. Um, he opens God's Word with new revelation. And uh, uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, probably, I don't want to say above all else, because how do we do that? But it fulfills the life of Jesus in our life. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. It fulfills the life of Jesus within us. We are extensions of His presence. Pentecost Holy Spirit produced the wind in the fire. And it was really the presence of God. And the presence of God is invaluable. Moses knew. He said, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. The presence of God is so powerful in the believer's life. It is a must. We must. We are extensions of His presence. He lives in us. And where we go, we should permeate the presence of the Lord. People should know that we're God's people. Did you know that you can go places and people you've never met will come up to you and say, Are you a believer? And when you shake your head, yes, they'll say, I just knew it. You see, the presence of God on His children just goes forth, and we are extensions of the presence of Jesus. We are also expressions of His personality, and that's the, that's the fruit of His Spirit. All of those things that Paul talks about, kindness, meekness, gentleness, Faith, you know, peace. You know, we're, 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 the, we're the personality of Jesus demonstrated in the world. This world needs love. They need kindness. They need forgiveness. They need peace. They need joy. They need faith. And we're the ones who can release that because we have the personality of Christ by the filling and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It opens up to us Everything, not only that the Holy Spirit has, it opens up to us everything that Jesus has. And as we talked about last week, the Holy Spirit takes the things of Jesus and reveals them to us, takes the things of the Father and declares them unto us and speaks them unto us. And so the the baptism in the Holy Spirit opens up a whole new realm of the Father, 
in a whole new realm of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is delighted to bring to us all that they have and all that they are. Now, I don't know about you, but I could almost clear off an acre and have a fit. Amen. I, I mean, when you think about that, everything that God and Jesus has are at our spiritual fingertips, and it's the Holy Spirit that, that brings them in a great way and magnifies them. So we are expressions of His personality. Then we are exhibits of His power. He said, we'll lay hands on the sick, they will be healed. said, we can cast out demons. said, we can raise the dead. said, we can preach the things of the Lord. Jesus said that we would speak in new tongues. I, I like that one. That's, that's something Jesus said. And, you know, I can't explain that away. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with that other than when Jesus said in the book of Mark that we would speak with new tongues. Uh, I don't know what to do with that other to, than to accept it and do it. Uh, uh, I, I've learned one thing. If Jesus says do it, it's a wise thing to do it, and uh, you'll never go wrong by doing what Jesus said to do. Then, uh, so we're exhibits of His power. We're to do the works of the kingdoms of the kingdom here on the earth, and to demonstrate that. And what Jesus did, we're to do. He was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to announce deliverance to the captive, to set the captives free, to open the blind eyes, to preach the year of the Lord. Jesus was anointed, and when he went back up to heaven and sent back the Holy Spirit in us, just as it was in him, then we're to do what he did under the same power that he did, and that was the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I, you know, there's no end. Uh, and here's one that we'll all love. The Holy Spirit enables us to die to self. Ah, we, we don't like that one. That's probably the fire, is to die to ourself and to give everything we have to Jesus. It is our union and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Now, how does a person receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Now, uh, there are many ways to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, if we could hear all the testimonies of people all over the world that have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we'd probably be amazed at how many ways it happens and it takes place. But three times in the book of Acts, it came with a laying on of hands. As the apostles, as Paul, as they laid on hands, they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, in other places, two times in the book of Acts, it comes by the Spirit just falling on them. Peter at Cornelius' house, as he was preaching the Word, he confirms his Word with signs and wonders, as he was preaching the word of salvation to these Romans, the Spirit fell upon them. When they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they began to speak with tongues and prophesy. And uh, uh, it was just, uh, Peter said, this is like it happened back on the day of Pentecost. And he just fell on them. And so there's been times when I've been ministering the word and the Holy Spirit has fallen on people and they've received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And uh, nobody laid hands on them or anything. But um, this was, uh, uh, my, my experience was the Holy Spirit just fell upon me the two times that he did. And, but let me, to be quick to say, that the Holy Spirit could baptize somebody. Uh, it could be, uh, it might be silently. All of a sudden, they begin to release. Um, all by themselves. Uh, it could be dramatically, it could be emotionally, uh, during a service. Uh, it could be en masse. Many times when we're ministering to a lot of people overseas or in a nation, then uh, we just minister it en masse when there's just so many people. And a lot of people receive uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit, as I have said, so wants to fill people with Himself that He's got ways to do it beyond what we could ever imagine or think. And, and so the beautiful thing is, is that he wants that. Now, uh, 
in the upper room, there was a spirit of unity. They were in one accord for 10 days. Their hearts were beating the same. Their thoughts were the same. Their minds were the same as they prayed, as they worshiped, as, as they did what Jesus said to do. He just told them to tarry. And we're supposing they prayed and they worshiped. And I don't think they just ate meals every day, but, but they were there. One of the things we do know, they were in one accord. They were in unity. And where there's unity, the Holy Spirit will show up and minister the things of God. And for 10 days, and, and they, they received that. We read in Psalms 133 that uh, God commands the blessing where there's unity. And this is in direct relation to the Holy Spirit. They were, he said, how, how good and pleasant it is together. It is for brethren to dwell together. It's like the oil that comes on the beard, even the beard, and flows down to the hem of the robes of his garment. He was talking about the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit. Where there's unity. If we could ever get people in unity and believing the same thing, it's there God commands the blessing and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit can be beyond anything that we could ever imagine. What are some things that help a person receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Well, you must be born again. That's key. Secondly, you, you must believe it's a biblical experience. That's very important that you believe it's a, it's a Bible truth. Uh, it's a Bible experience. And um, sometimes you need instruction. When the uh, Philip went to the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, he said, what are you reading? And he said, how can I know unless somebody show me? And many times salvation, the preacher will say, here's what you need to do to be born again. Amen. You know, you need to repent. You need to, yeah, you know. And, and so we, we instruct people how to be born again. So we instruct people on how to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And uh, Jesus said that very clearly. You must be thirsty. He said, if you're thirsty, come to me. Every human being without exception has a spiritual thirst that drives them to the ultimate creator and living God. So you, you, you must be thirsty. Uh, uh, just as our physical bodies need water, which I probably need some water right now, every day to survive, we need water every day to survive, so our spirits need the life-giving spiritual water of the Holy Spirit every day in order to survive. My wife tells me, the more water I drink, the healthier I'll be. So I try to drink more water. But um, the more of the Holy Spirit we embrace and we drink and receive into our life, the healthier we're going to be spiritually. And... Three days without water, the human body begins to die. In the same way, people who do not have an ample supply, a fullness supply of the Holy Spirit, are going to begin to die spiritually. And so Jesus' invitation was simple. If you're thirsty, come unto me. You see, a lot of people are going to a leader, into a man, into an institution. Jesus said, come unto me. Come unto me. He is the, the, the one to come to. And he didn't promise just a glass. But he said, rivers of living water will flow out of you. And so we must come to Jesus and believe that he's the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. And also, you must believe it's for you. There's a lot of people who think, well, it's not for me. It's for my friend. It's for the preacher. It's for the evangelist. No, it is for you. It is for everybody. The book of Acts says the promise, that is the promise of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so you must believe 
and receive and drink. Just like you did when you were born again, you can believe. And so it can be a prayer like this. Lord, I believe in the biblical gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I believe you're the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Baptize me now. Release from me those new tongues you said I would speak in. I believe and I receive. And as you pray a prayer something like that, then lift your hands and you can do it in your bedroom, wherever you are in a church service, in an altar, and begin to praise the Lord and begin to speak out that new heavenly language that's in the Spirit, resident in you because you've asked Jesus for it. And because you've asked Him for it, He's going to give it to you. He'll give you what you ask for. Luke 9, 13 to 20, tell us that. He'll give you what you ask for. How much more does the Heavenly Father want to give to you the Holy Spirit and the things of the Spirit if you'll ask Him? And then begin to speak with your new tongues. You'll begin to hear a syllable in, in your spirit. Uh, maybe your mind, a word, and begin to speak that out. Now, say it loud enough where you can hear it, because as you hear it, it's going to begin to build confidence, and then before you, then before you know, God uh, can give you a full language. Now, sometimes it's just a word, it's just a statement, it's just a phrase, but when you say it out loud, you build up your confidence, and the Holy Spirit begins to work with that. So it's it's good to do that. And then just release it. And, uh, um, and it'll come forth in your life. If at the time you ask the Lord to do that, and for some reason it does not manifest or come forth, don't give up. That doesn't mean He hasn't done what you've asked Him to do. There's some reason why it's not happened, so continue to seek Him. I've had many people who did not receive it at the altar, but on the way home in the car, they received it. Or somewhere else, they received it. And so I want to say to you that it's there in the Spirit. Now, we're going to take just a few minutes more because we're about out of time here. But hindrances to receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit is lack of proper instruction. Paul said that, that he would not have those to be unlearned. Now concerning the spiritual things, I would not have you to be unlearned. So Paul gave instruction that people, believers, ought to be taught about the things of the Spirit. So that's one reason that's a hindrance. Then a second one could be pride, um, uh, or I don't need that, or peer pressure. They can all keep you from receiving the fullness or unbelief. Unbelief is the mother of all sins. Uh, that can keep you from receiving. Or the fear of what will happen because of stories you've heard, abuse and misuse of the gift of tongues. Uh, that can keep you from, from receiving the fear of the unknown. But know that the Holy Spirit, your heart being right, the Holy Spirit will see to it that you receive what you ask for and what it is good and what will come of the Spirit. You'll not get anything that's uh, from anybody else. And so that's important to know. Then another reason people do not receive is false doctrine or teaching. Uh, you may have been told it's of the devil. You may have been told it's not for today. Uh, you may have been told you won't be able to control yourself. And, and those are all lies. And so false doctrine and teaching can hinder you from receiving. Then uh, sin, unforgiveness, rebellion, a heart that's not right uh, before God, uh, that, can, that can be a hindrance. Or occult or demonic activity. Sometimes that can be a hindrance. And not always. And so uh, a heart that's not right cannot receive anything from God. And so, I, I want to encourage you today that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is an incredible experience. And maybe you've not received, and I want to pray for you right now. And would you just open your heart to receive? Father, in Jesus' name, 
Thank you for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Thank you that it's in your word and that Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, baptize right now this person who is thirsty and hungry and they're after your heart. Fill them now with your Holy Spirit. Lord, give them their new tongue, their new language. Lord, let it come forth in their heart and in their life. Father, I pray, Lord, take these truths, O God, and seal them in those who have heard them. Lord, show us there's more and more and more of the Father and of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit. I pray, bless my brothers and sisters on the front lines. Lord, bless them for their sacrifice and their goodness and their service. In Jesus' name, amen.